All right, the minor prophets uh, for beginners, majoring in minors, lesson number eight, Nahum and Habakkuk, Nahum and Habakkuk. So we now move to study the prophets uh, who lived and uh, prophesied before the fall of the Southern Kingdom. We've, we've covered the prophets that worked uh, during and before the uh, fall of the Northern Kingdom, 721 BC, we kind of come down a century and a half, and now we're into the prophets who, um, who worked during the time of the Southern Kingdom. And the first one we want to talk about is uh, Nahum, the prophet Nahum, let me get some information up. The name Nahum means consolation or comfort. The message that he proclaimed was one of consolation to the oppressed people of Judah in that it spoke of God's vengeance upon the enemies of his people. So Nahum was from the city of Elkosh, whose location is unknown to us today. We don't know anything about his parents or his occupation or his life history. Uh, we're able to give the ministry of Nahum an approximate date from two events that he refers in his books, in other words, internal evidence that we have. He mentions Thebes, uh, the city of Thebes, uh, or uh, it's also called Noamun. Uh, this city had already fallen when he prophesied uh, in chapter three, verse eight. He mentions that this city has fallen and we know the date of that time. Then the fall of Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the fall of that city was yet to come. And he talks about that in chapter 2, 13 and chapter 3, verse 5 and 7 and then in verse 15. So since the former uh, city, the city of Thebes, uh, the fall of that city occurred in 661 BC, and the latter city, the city of Nineveh, fell in 612 BC. His ministry must be dated between these two events. Most scholars narrow the date to the period between 630 and 612 BC. He was a contemporary of other prophets, the prophet Zephaniah, and Habakkuk, which we're going to talk about, uh, two minor prophets, and also he was a contemporary of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the times, uh, you know, when uh, he uh, conducted his uh, ministry. Approximately 150 years before Nahum's pronouncement of doom on the city of Nineveh, Jonah had been sent to the very same city. Jonah's preaching uh, brought about its repentance at a time of despair in her history. And we studied about that last week. Jonah goes to Nineveh, Jonah preaches, and Nineveh, Nineveh repents from the king all the way down to the lowest citizen. So, uh, but in, Jonah, in Nahum's day, we, we fast forward a century and a half, in Nahum's day, Nineveh was at the height uh, of her power and uh, glory uh, as Assyria's capital city. It was wealthy, it was haughty, it was impenitent. Um, it's as if Nahum's book is the sequel to Jonah's book. You know, Jonah goes in, they repent, they're saved from doom, and you know, the, the, the story ends rather suddenly in Jonah, and then when you go to Nahum's book, he picks it up 150 years later, and it's a very different Nineveh now. They're no longer in pen, they're no longer penitent, they're no longer respecting uh, God's word, and so on and so forth. Um, when Nahum prophesied, Nineveh's day of grace was past. Repentance is not even mentioned, and there's no prospect of deliverance from God uh, from God's wrath uh, that is talked about. And I've mentioned this before, there's a certain cycle that, uh, that most of the prophets, um, their prophecies uh, followed. Uh, one was uh, calling out you know, what the sin was and what the problem was. Uh, then there was a call to repentance. Uh, 
Uh, and then there was a, a mention of uh, doom and punishment, you know, retribution for the sins, you know, if they didn't repent. And then usually at the end of most, most of the prophets, uh, major and minor prophets, the prophet would uh, say something about what would happen if there was repentance. If you come back to the Lord, there'll be times of refreshment, you know, the Lord will bless you again. You know? And that was the kind of the pattern of preaching for most of the major and minor prophets. But when you get to Nahum, uh, there's no um, mention of any restoration. Uh, there's only a prophecy of doom and punishment, period. You know, doom is coming, you're gonna get what you deserve, and there's no chance for repentance. There's no, you know, there's no promise of good times ahead. Uh, it's all uh, pretty much uh, gloom, and, uh, gloom and doom. Um, whereas the book of Jonah uh, demonstrates the mercy of God, uh, Nahum demonstrates the vengeance uh, upon those who are impenitent. We read in uh, chapter one, verse two, he says, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. So in spite of his patience, in spite of God's uh, goodness, he will not tolerate sin indefinitely. Uh, in uh, chapter one, verse three, we continue, it says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath, uh, beneath his feet. So uh, as one reads the book of uh, Nahum, uh, we need to bear in mind that he's not a reading of uh, Nahum's personal hatred for or joy in the overthrow of Nineveh. In other words, Nahum is not like Jonah. Jonah hated these people. He didn't want God to save them. He was angry because God did this. And you know, uh, I said last time that uh, the, uh, the book ends suddenly. Uh, there's no closure in the book, uh, reflecting the idea that there was no closure in, in Jonah's mind, you know, he still hated these people after God, he even says to God, look, look what you did. I knew you were gonna do this. I knew if, the, if I went there and preached and those people would repent, you would save them, you wouldn't destroy them. I knew that was why, you know, and that's why I didn't wanna go. And it just leaves it at that. You know, he, he, there's no repentance on, on his part. Well, Nahum, there's none of that in Nahum's, uh, there's no hatred for the people. He's just there to de deliver the message. Uh, from, uh, from God. Uh, some critical scholars, when I say critical scholars, critical scholars are uh, uh, scholars that believe that the Bible is just made up of various literary works from different individuals and just kind of edited and put together by people, usually don't believe in inspiration. Uh, so some critical scholars say that this book is not trustworthy because it presents God as being vengeful. Um, however, a closer look at uh, the great leaders shows that they possess one or more of the following characteristics. For example, they have the capacity for great love. They have the capacity for great enthusiasm and also the capacity for great indignation. And so the point I'm making here uh, for the prophet Nahum is that he symbolizes the last of these, indignation. It is Nahum who is so often missed in contemporary and conventional uh, Christianity. Uh, we're so good natured, so fastidious, so complacent, so dainty, so nice about everything. But if we had one tenth of Nahum's passionate love of truth and righteousness, we would at times be filled with a passionate hatred of evil and corruption. And I've kind of read that because that's a quote from a book by a person named Raymond Calkin. Uh, his book is uh, Modern Message of the Minor Prophets. And his point in his book is that if we had a little bit of Nahum's indignation of the sinfulness of the world, we'd have a little more power in preaching the gospel and announcing that there will be condemnation, that there will, there's a judgment coming. And so Christianity is not all about, you know, uh, 
uh, being nice and being kind and forgiving your enemy and so on and so forth. There's also a judgment aspect uh, about Christianity. And Nahum uh, is a, a good example of a believer, a servant of the Lord, who is indignant at the sinfulness of the people and uh, ready to deliver his message with zeal. So the point here is that there are times when we as individual Christians or as the church, there are times we need to speak out and warn the world of the judgment to come uh, because of sin and, uh, and uh, disbelief. Uh, there are not a lot of sermons like that. You know, uh, I've learned in my career that when I preach a sermon, you know, one of those uh, hell and damnation sermons, you know, that there's going to be a judgment. There are people who are going to be lost, the majority, as a matter of fact. Uh, it, it, I, I think the, the response I get is, quietness. It becomes very, very quiet while I'm, while I'm preaching. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the effect that those kind of sermons have. Uh, but once in a while, we, we have to, we have to um, uh, preach the whole gospel. The whole gospel uh, involves the fact that there's a judgment coming. Uh, the reason that we say, uh, we don't say to people, would you like to become part of our club? Would you like to become part of our happy, friendly church? That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is, uh, are you saved? And usually the implication of, are you saved, is that you're in danger of being lost. Uh, why? Because there's a judgment coming. Uh, are you saved? Will you be saved from that judgment? So Nahum embodies the character of that of that message. This is the point I'm, I'm trying to make. So the book itself, uh, details on the book. The book of Nahum may be outlined uh, as uh, follow. The first part of his book, The God of Vengeance, chapter one, verses one to 15. Uh, so in this section, he talks about the prophet and his theme in verse one. God's wrath against sin, God's mercy to the faithful, God's pursuit of his enemies. Uh, and also uh, the overthrow uh, of the nation of, of Nineveh, the overthrow will be complete when it comes. And the interesting thing from a literary perspective is the first chapter in Nahum's book is an alphabetical acrostic. I think in other classes you may have learned what an acrostic is. It's a literary device uh, where um, it's a Hebrew literary device where each verse begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So if it was in English, for example, the first verse would start with A and the second verse would start with B and the third verse would start with C and then D and then E and F and G and so on and so forth. It was a literary device used by Hebrew uh, writers uh, simply to draw attention to something or to give it uh, uh, some sort of form. Uh, also, uh, an acrostic uh, didn't have to include all of the letters of the alphabet. The purpose uh, of arrangement is what constitutes an acrostic. In other words, uh, if it was in English, you could go all the way to the letter G and then stop uh, and it would still be an acrostic. You wouldn't have to go from A to Z for it to be considered an acrostic, okay? Second part of uh, his book, Nineveh's Distress, chapter one, nine to 213. I mentioned that uh, Nahum, when he talks about the attack or the, uh, the suffering of Nineveh, her overthrow would be complete, the, no coming back. Also, uh, a prophetic vision of the coming siege. Uh, uh, he talks about a preparation of battle. In other words, uh, you'll prepare for battle and you'll all be ready for battle, but it will be futile. It doesn't matter what you do to get ready for this battle, you're gonna lose. That's part of his message. Uh, and then he talks about in chapter two, the plundering of the city itself, the confused flight of the people, the, the completeness of the destruction. Uh, sometimes people read Nahum and they, 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 they don't realize that he's not talking about Jerusalem. He's not talking about the Jews. 
he's a Jewish prophet, but he's talking about the fall of a, of a pagan uh, city, a pagan uh, uh, nation. And then the third part is reasons for Nineveh's doom. First thing he mentions, chapter three, her sins. He describes the battle. He uh, explains the cause of the doom. He uh, talks about her shame uh, being uncovered by God. And also the impossibility of her survival. It's a very depressing message uh, for the simple fact that there's no element of hope there. It's just, you have disobeyed God. This has gone on long enough. Your punishment is coming and this is what it's going to look like. And there's nothing you can do uh, to avoid it. Uh, this is the subject of his, uh, of, especially in chapter three, verses 18, uh, eight to 19, the impossibility of her survival. Nineveh will share the same fate as the other city, the city of Thebes, uh, and her resources will not, uh, will not save her. They, they won't be able to buy their way out of destruction. They won't be able to fight their way out of destruction. Uh, you know, the, uh, the prophecy is set. So as I said, unlike other prophets, there's no section of his book that promised better days or a time of redemption. Nahum pronounces a final judgment and destruction of Nineveh. So those are the, you know, this is how the book is broken down. The content of the book, we go a little bit deeper. Chapter one presents Jehovah as a jealous and avenging God who punishes evil and wicked Nineveh will be destroyed while those who trust in God will be spared. The divine wrath would be like fire, like an overwhelming flood. That's the description that he uses. The Assyrian yoke on the people of Judah would be broken and the once proud oppressors would go to the grave. So as far as the Jews were concerned, it wasn't about them, but it was good news to them. The fact that their enemy, the fact that their persecutor, the one that had kept them down will be destroyed by God meant that they would be free. So for them, uh, they read this with, uh, with some amount of, uh, of joy. Chapter two pictures the sending of a powerful army against Nineveh. The city was to be conquered. It would be utterly destroyed and Judah would, uh, would uh, rejoice. Um, so thorough, uh, this is historically speaking, so thorough was the de devastation of the city of Nineveh that it wasn't until 1845 that the site was identified and the ruins were uncovered. Um, Archaeology has confirmed the biblical account of its, uh, of its uh, destruction. And here you have a picture, a modern day picture of the ongoing work in you know, uh, uh, recovering the city of Nineveh. But it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, many other ancient cities have, were discovered you know, hundreds of years ago. They found the ancient cities and uh, you know, reconstructed them. But Nineveh, it took until 1845, uh, you know, 2000, 3000, 2,500 years later to, to actually find where the city uh, had originally uh, been built. Uh, so complete was the destruction of this place. Chapter three uh, informs men that Nineveh has brought this terrible fate upon herself. Like a, like a harlot who uses her charms to seduce men, so had Nineveh used her prestige and power and other enticements to trap and plunder and destroy entire nations. And so God's destruction would soon come upon this evil city and no power would be able to prevent this wrath. A couple of lessons, you know what, man, there's so many ways to go on this here, you know, for lessons, but uh, a couple of lessons that we can uh, draw easily. Uh, God is sovereign, uh, but I added the word today. We often say that God is sovereign, but he's sovereign today. Uh, for a nation to survive, it must be founded upon and guided by the principle of righteousness. Otherwise, God will dig a grave for that people and deliver them into it. Uh, Nahum talks about that in chapter one, verse 14. And so God is still sovereign over the nations today. 
and the nations that are doing things today which go against God's will, they will ultimately pay the price uh, for that. Uh, another uh, lesson, um, righteousness needs renewal in every generation. And, and Nineveh is a good example of that. Uh, humility and penitence do not necessarily perpetuate themselves in a family or, or in a nation. Nineveh repented with sincerity in Jonah's day only to have become totally depraved by the time Nahum uh, came on the scene. And so the, the truth must be taught anew to every uh, oncoming generation. This includes ourselves today in the church and in this nation. You know, uh, we have to continually teach the next generation about what is the church? Who is the church? Who is Christ? How should we be formed? How should we function? And so on and so forth. And so righteousness needs renewal in every uh, generation. It's not hereditary. You know, your grandchildren who, are, if some of you are old enough to have grandchildren that are of marrying age, those grandchildren, when they get married, has, have to begin the process all over again. Uh, one of the things that's so heartening in this congregation is to see so many grandparents bringing their grandchildren to church. It's, of course, much more joyful if, if the if the, if the children come and they bring their children with them, but in the absence of having uh, you know, sons and daughters that bring their grandchildren, when I see grandparents making the effort to bring the children to church to try to give them some uh, instruction uh, in the Lord's way, I, I find that uh, commendable, very commendable. And what a gift that you're giving uh, to, these, uh, to these children. And then another lesson, Faithfulness During Turmoil. Uh, the book answers uh, that God is a refuge to those who trust in him, even in the midst of troubling circumstances, whether that be political unrest or economic uncertainty or conflict between nations or natural disasters. I mean, there's nothing new in that. You know, didn't Jesus say there'll be wars and rumors of wars? Didn't he say that? Didn't he say the poor you will have, you'll always have with you? Didn't he say that? You know, this war on poverty, we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of poverty. Really? You know, every generation has the same kinds of, of problems and every generation of Christians uh, have to uh, determine if they're going to be faithful during the turmoil that happens to uh, take place in, in their generation. And so these type of things are a given for a life in a sinful world. The only true protection and comfort and hope is faith in God and faith in his, uh, in his promises. And I think uh, uh, Nahum's book uh, teaches us that. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, every generation has to face its own challenges. And uh, every generation of Christians uh, face the challenges of their era in the very same way. And that's by clinging to Jesus Christ, by having faith uh, in him and knowing and following his word. Those are the protections. Uh, that's, those are the things that protect us in every uh, generation. I, I feel very badly for uh, young people who don't know God's word and who don't know the Lord. I mean, I actually feel bad for them to face the things that are taking place in the world without the strength that comes from God's, uh, from God's word. Okay, so there's a, you know, some uh, information about Nahum. Uh, as always, I tell you, go back this week and reread the, uh, re -read the book. And hopefully in rereading the book with this information, uh, it'll really uh, come to life for you. All right, next uh, prophet uh, we're going to talk about is Habakkuk, 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 you know, there's a Habakkuk. Uh, I've checked different pronunciations, you know, so I'm going to stick with Habakkuk. Um, we move on to the prophet Habakkuk who lived in the southern kingdom and he warned of the eventual destruction of the southern kingdom. So Nahum, he warned of the destruction of Nineveh. He didn't talk to north or south. He, he talked about Nineveh. 
Habakkuk, he talks about the southern uh, kingdom. Uh, his name means clasp, to clasp or to embrace. Uh, Martin Luther, the Protestant uh, reformist, Martin Luther applied the meaning of this prophet's name to the task that he performed among the people of Judah. And I quote what he wrote. He says, um, Habakkuk embraces his people and takes them to his arms. He comforts them and holds them up as one embraces a weeping child or person to quiet it with the assurance that if God will, it shall be better soon. And that's a quote uh, from a commentary uh, by uh, Martin Luther. Um, the prophet's name appears nowhere in scripture except in this book. Uh, he mentions uh, it in chapter one, verse one. His home is unknown. We know nothing about his uh, occupation. Again, we only know about the work that he did in the name of the Lord. Unlike many uh, of the other minor prophets, uh, Habakkuk does not date his prophecy by referring to the king or the kings during his reign uh, when he ministered. But uh, chapter one, verse six appears to throw some light on this problem. Assyria had fallen and Chaldea or Babylon was not yet the world power. This change of power occurred in 612 BC. And yet the Chaldeans had not at the time of Habakkuk's ministry invaded Judah. We find this out in chapter three, verse 16. This invasion did not come in 605 BC. Thus, the book is dated somewhere between 612 and 605. You know, we know that Nineveh has fallen, uh, but Judah has not yet fallen. So we know that he, he's, he's writing in between those, those, two, uh, those two events. To give you an idea of the scope, uh, when we talk about you know, the world power in those days, meaning the dominant power, uh, take a look at the size of Samaria and, uh, and Judah, or Israel and Judah together, and take a look at the green there, which represents the uh, Assyrian Empire eventually taken over uh, by the uh, Babylonians. It, it was huge. Uh, their, their influence was, uh, uh, was uh, tremendous. And so Habakkuk um, was a contemporary of Jeremiah and he came on the scene only uh, shortly after uh, Nahum. Uh, so Babylon's conquest of the Southern Kingdom took place in phases. Uh, beginning uh, in 605 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar II made the first of many attacks against the Southern Kingdom. These finally culminated in 586 BC, when he finally conquered and destroyed Jerusalem and carried the people away into captivity for 70 years. So it's not, look, it's not like they came and in one day and took over the city. You know, they made many attacks over the years uh, you know, from 605, but in 586, uh, finally 20 years, about uh, 20 years of, uh, of siege and, and, and attacks, they finally conquered the city of Jerusalem. As far as the, the time that uh, Habakkuk lived, uh, he lived at the time of uh, the Chaldean supremacy or Babylonian supremacy in history. This new power had defeated the Assyrians and would soon conquer Egypt as well. So it was inevitable that Judah would also feel the force of the Chaldeans uh, under Nebuchadnezzar. So you see Nahum talks about uh, Nineveh, eventually Nineveh falls and it, it falls because of the Babylonians and then the Babylonians uh, begin to exert pressure on Jerusalem and other uh, nations uh, around them. And so the prophet foretold the catastrophe which was about to come and he actually lived to see it happen. However, we don't know if he was killed during the, uh, you know, the attack or if he was carried off or if he was part of those who remained in uh, Judah, we don't, we don't know that. In spite of the warnings uh, of impending disaster from Jeremiah and Habakkuk, the hearts of the Jews were still set on sin. There was social injustice, 
moral corruption widespread, idolatry was rampant in the land, the time was ripe for judgment upon these wicked people whom God had blessed so richly, and the Chaldeans were there to serve as instruments of God's wrath upon his uh, people. So uh, the fact that God was about to use a pagan people who were even more wicked than the Jews, um, uh, God was going to use this wicked people to punish them, forms the basis of the book of Habakkuk. In other words, where is the justice in such a situation? How can it be right for these pagans to prosper at the expense of God's own uh, people? Uh, so the form of the book of Habakkuk is unique. The other minor prophets, they plead with the people on behalf of God, okay? They plead with the people on behalf of God. But Habakkuk, he pleads with God on behalf of the people. There's the difference. And so uh, Habakkuk dialogues with God over this inability to understand what is happening in the land. So in chapter two, verse one, it says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart and I will keep watch to see what he, meaning God, will speak to me and how I may reply when I am uh, reproved. And the crucial answer given to Habakkuk is in, in chapter two, verse four, it says, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Doesn't that sound familiar? But the righteous will live uh, by his faith. Habakkuk is saying, how could we survive? Uh, all these other nations are falling. You're using a wicked nation to punish us. They're worse than we are and so on and so forth. And God, what's the answer? And God says to him, the righteous will live by faith. Will live, and then in this case, not just live his everyday life. The righteous will survive this turmoil. The righteous will be able to uh, survive even the destruction of their own nation, uh, not by power, not by answering the wise, but by having faith and trust uh, in God. Uh, surely the nature of this book makes it one of immediate concern to people today. We, uh, don't we ask why the wicked people uh, uh, you know, prosper and the righteous suffer? Do we not puzzle over the ways of God many times? Habakkuk, the Job of the Minor Prophets, he's referred to as the Job of the Minor Prophets, uh, is interesting for this reason alone. He questions God, not for what is happening to himself, but rather how God is dealing with his own people. Why use a wicked, ungodly people to discipline the actual people of God? That's his question to God. And, and, and it forms the framework of his, uh, of his uh, uh, prophecy. So if we're going to analyze the book at all, a little outline uh, to help us uh, understand the flow of his thinking, um, it can be outlined as follows. First, Habakkuk's first question and God's reply in chapter one, verse 11. So you have the title of the book and the question, why does God tolerate sin among his people? And the reply, God is raising up the Chaldeans to punish the wrongdoers. So there you have a question and a reply in the first chapter. Habakkuk's second question and God's reply is in chapter one, verse 12, all the way to chapter two, verse 20. Habakkuk's question is, how can God use the ungodly Chaldeans to punish his own people? I mean, the people of God, the reply, the Chaldeans shall, punish, shall be punished in turn. In other words, God's reply is, don't worry about that. After the Chaldeans are finished you know, disciplining uh, the Jewish, the, the, you know, Judah, then I will discipline the Chaldeans. Their turn for punishment uh, will come uh, afterwards. And so uh, in the following uh, chapter, uh, we see the contrast between pride and faith. And then he pronounces five woes uh, on the Chaldeans. In other words, yes, the Chaldeans are going to you know, punish 
uh, uh, Judah, but the Chaldeans will also be punished. And, and he names five woes uh, for which they will be punished. Uh, woe upon their lust for conquest, chapter two, verse six to eight. Woe upon the covetousness, uh, chapter two, nine to 11. Woe upon building of cities with blood, meaning uh, you know, the blood of, uh, of others and, and uh, plundering other nations in order to build their own uh, empire. Chapter two, verses 12 to 14. Woe upon e intoxication and violence. And then woe upon idolatry. Chapter two, verse 18 to 20. So there you have the interaction between God and uh, Habakkuk. Then in chapter three, you have his prayer, Habakkuk's prayer. Um, a petition for mercy, uh, confidence based on the past. In other words, seeing the things that God has done in the past, he has confidence in God. And then the prophet's faith expressed, chapter 3, 16 to 19. In other words, he demonstrates his confidence amid fear. He's afraid, bad things are going to happen, but he remains confident in God. And also he rejoices in God's integrity in all of this evil, in all of this violence, in all of this immorality and failure, uh, uh, God's own righteousness shines through. It's a great comfort when you look at the world and you see uh, the failings of the world, the sinfulness in the world. It's a great comfort to recognize that God is always righteous, always righteous. He's always good, he's always there. He's always, he never changes. Uh, and, and Habakkuk takes comfort in this idea that you can always find comfort in the idea that God is um, always the same, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the content uh, of the book, we dig just a little bit deeper. Chapter one uh, raises the problem of sin and violence in Judah. The, the prophet cries out, how long? How long is this going to go on? And God answers by informing Habakkuk that he knows of this awful condition and he's preparing to bring the Chaldeans against these people to punish them. This in turn causes the prophet to ask how God can punish Judah with a nation more wicked than itself. So it's a kind of a <laughs> poor Habakkuk. He's crying out to God, how long are you going to tolerate this people disobeying you and being unfaithful? And I'm, you know, I talk, I talk, I preach to them, I do all this and they don't obey. And how long are you going to put up with this? You know, he wants God to punish them. And then God said, don't worry, I'm going to bring the Assyrians in to, uh, excuse me, I'm going to bring the Chaldeans in to really punish them and to destroy them and so on and so forth. And then uh, Habakkuk, uh, he puts on the brakes and goes, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, I wanted you to punish them, but you're gonna use a, a more evil nation than, than, than us. You know, God's people you're going to punish with, with uh, uh, unbelievers and pagans, you know? So that's the dilemma uh, that, he, uh, that he feels. Uh, chapter two, chapter two uh, answers the second question by revealing that the Chaldeans shall also be punished and sets forth the fun fundamental principle of God's dealing with men. Uh, in other words, proud men who refuse to trust God must suffer, whereas those who are righteous because of their faith in God, they will live. And then uh, chapter three uh, is a psalm, if you wish, of confident trust. Having raised the difficult problems of chapters one and two, Habakkuk declares that he has enough evidence of God's integrity to trust him in the face of the great adversity which is about to take place. And so the last section is Habakkuk's message uh, for today. What's in it for us today? It would seem that this scene and these problems uh, are far removed from our lives uh, today but not as much as you might think. So first of all, perspective affects our worship of God. Perspective affects our worship of God. Despite change in time, you know, from that time to today, God still requires the same thing. Perspective affects our worship to God. 
I explained this in another question. How to worship God when help or deliverance does not come? This is the problem of Habakkuk's book. It's difficult to worship God when we see him through the perspective of trouble and illness and adversity. Some people think that God is their deliverer and this is their perspective. However, what happens when God does not deliver? How do you worship him then? How do you see him then? And so Habakkuk, he deals with this question. He's seen God you know, from the former prophets. God promised renewal. God, you know, God promised to save us. And now he's not going to save us. Well, how do I worship a God that's not going to save us? And so in chapter one, the prophet questions God because the God he perceived as a deliverer was not about to deliver the people. So God, is, God responds that he's working a plan that the prophet cannot understand. And what is the plan that the prophet can't understand? Well, that God is using an evil nation to dis discipline his own people. Habakkuk, you know, he couldn't wrap his mind around that idea. The prophet and God, they dialogue back and forth over this issue. The prophet does not understand this action or God's part. This is not in his character. Now this is from Habakkuk's perspective. His perspective is, the God that I worship delivers his people. And now all of a sudden, the God that he worships is not going to deliver his people. He's going to punish them with an evil nation. And you know, this is too much. He couldn't fit it into his, into his mind. And so in chapter two, the prophet stops the dialogue and he chooses to wait for God's answer. And God reassures him that he is working a plan and he tells the prophet to tell the people that he has a plan and regardless of the problem, the righteous must live by faith. There's my point. Habakkuk couldn't understand, he couldn't get his mind around it. And the answer that God gives him is not to go into the theological details of how he's working things out in his mind. The answer that he gives to Habakkuk is, the righteous live by faith. Let me do my work, trust me. If you want to be righteous, then trust me and live by faith. This is the truth in every generation. This is the believer's you know, zone, regardless of the circumstances. You know, we always say in athletics, you know, he's in the zone, she's in the zone. You know, in other words, everything's working perfectly. They're at peak performance, you know. Well, Christians are in the zone when they're living by faith. That's where they're operating at peak performance. Why? Because we don't understand God's ways, that's why. He's not human. He's not like us. He tells us, I'm not like you. My ways are not your ways. My thinking, not your thinking. So how do we deal with someone that we just can't you know, understand? Well, the answer is the righteous will live by faith. That's how we can uh, live with God uh, when uh, we can't always understand everything there is uh, to understand. And so God asks Habakkuk to get the proper perspective on God and the situation. And that's in chapter two, verse 20. He says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. The idea is that God is in control. Don't, don't judge him by the events that are taking place. When you know this, you have the proper perspective. And what is the proper perspective? The proper perspective is that he is in control and we should respond with worship and praise and respect and faith. That's when we're in the zone, the proper uh, zone. David in Psalm 46 verse 10, he says, uh, 
uh, be still and know uh, that I am God. Job, for example, he thought he had the proper perspective of God until God actually spoke and explained to him the proper perspective. He, you know, Job said, I, I thought I knew you, but now I put my hand over my mouth. You know, I, I, I realized I didn't understand a thing about you. What does God say? In, in he, the writer says in Hebrew, he, he says, by faith, we understand that the world was created, you know, by things that are not seen. God is telling us, you, you don't have to have all the physical and scientific and mathematical uh, equations and uh, biological and chemical uh, explanations uh, to know how the world came into being and how it all, and you know, you don't have to know all of that. All you have to know and accept is that what is uh, has been created from what is not seen. Well, if it's not seen, what he means is we don't understand it. It's like trying to explain uh, advanced calculus to a four-year-old. It's beyond us. So I, I always appreciate those who give us some explanations and, and they defend you know, the idea of the creation and so on and so forth and they have good explanations and it builds our faith. But really God is, he's saying to us, this is, this is a thing you have to accept by faith. The resurrection you don't have to accept just by faith. I'll give you proof of the resurrection. I have witnesses and they wrote down their witness and so you've got something to go on. But how the world was created, nah. That you accept by faith. Just trust me on, on that one. And this is basically what he's saying to Habakkuk. You don't quite understand what I'm doing, right? Punishing the chosen people with you know, pagans, I, I know you don't get the plan and I'm not going to explain it to you. You just have to, you know, if you want to be righteous, then you'll accept by faith what I'm, what I'm, what I'm doing. And then in, in chapter three, Habakkuk explains his new uh, uh, perspective. Uh, he says, though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. What's he saying here? Even though everything falls apart around me, even though the things that I count on for my daily sustenance stop, yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yet I will trust in him. Well, we don't, I don't think we're, I don't know how many of you are sheep farmers or growing olives in your backyard or doing that type of thing, but you have people who are sick in your family. You have good righteous people who have lost their homes uh, suffer terrible sorrow with, with the death of a, of a loved one. You know, all those type of things have happened to you. Uh, what's the answer to that? Well, I will yet rejoice in the God of my salvation. God's plan is too big. It's too much for me to, to understand rationally. I, I will simply accept by faith that he is in control, not me. Now that's easy when everything's going great. Not so, not so much when things are, are starting to, to fall apart. So even though there is no evidence, the prophet will continue trusting and praising and obeying God. And what do we call this? We call it perseverance. Perseverance of the saints. You know, a lot of times we think perseverance is just hanging in there when things are tough. Yes hanging in there when things are tough, but how? Well, hanging in there, still believing, still worshiping, still serving God, still finding ways to rejoice in his presence. That's perseverance, despite the craziness that's going on around us. All right, lessons for our, you know, what lessons can we draw from this uh, real quickly? Well, first of all, all men and all nations are in the power of God. 
He may tolerate their sin for a time, but he will eventually render them their just reward. This is certain, absolutely certain. You look at the nations, you look at leaders, you look at you know, violence that's taking place in the world, justice will be done. Not to worry, God tells us. Secondly, very quickly, Habakkuk shows that men can hold fast to their faith in the goodness and power of God in the midst of great trials. You can still be faithful even when everything is not going well around you. As a matter of fact, uh, this is the time we actually shine forth uh, before God. Third lesson, evil is self-destructive. Chapter three emphasizes that evil is eventually self-destructive. A nation so wicked as Babylon carried with itself the seeds of its own destruction, just as wicked nations and there are wicked nations today. And then finally, be still and know God. If we understand who God is, not a being fitted to our perspective, but rather who he really is and who we really are, then we will be brought into silence because of his majesty. When we come before God, you know, people say, well, when I get up to God in heaven, I'm gonna ask him this and I'm gonna say, boy, that sure was tough back in the, you know, 86 when you did this and that. No, I think when you come before God, you'll put your hand before your mouth. So we can be still and know that he is God. And the more we know him as God, the more still we can become. Okay, well, that's our uh, lesson for today. Uh, I realize that doing two in one is a little longer than a normal lesson. I appreciate uh, your, uh, your patience. Um, uh, reading assignment, go back and reread Nahum and Habakkuk. Hopefully now it'll, you know, be a little more uh, meaningful. And read ahead, Zephaniah and Haggai. We have two lessons left in our series as uh, uh, will, be, will be done. So thank you for your patience and your, uh, your uh, attendance.